finally really did it. You maniacs! You blew it up! Damn you! Damn you all to hell! That was Charlton Heston at the end of the original 1968 Planet of the Apes movie. Spoiler alert, in the film, our world has been taken over by apes after we humans mismanaged it. Well, you can imagine what the new documentary, Planet of the Humans, might be about. Does it have a point? Next, on the Growthbusters podcast. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growthbusters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are we in the process of blowing it up, destroying our planet and human civilization? Well, that's hardly up for debate in the new documentary, Planet of the Humans, executive produced by Michael Moore. What is up for debate about this controversial film is whether we've been getting the full truth about renewable energy's ability to solve the climate crisis. The film raises important questions and has stirred up a hornet's nest of controversy. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to share the conversation we had on a webinar about the film, Planet of the Humans, a sequel. What did the film get right, and what should we do about it? Welcome to the Growthbusters podcast. We're blowing up our society's addiction to growth and doing our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. I'm Dave Gardner, chief scientist here at the Institute for Advanced Growth Addiction Studies. Erica isn't with me for the opening, but she is on the panel in this webinar you're about to hear. For cutting-edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. Now, you can watch a video replay of our Planet of the Humans webinar on the Growthbusters YouTube channel. We'll put a link in the show notes. But if you can't sit still for 90-plus minutes to watch a video, have no fear. The podcast version is here. We're sharing the audio of that webinar here as a special episode of the podcast. Before we go to the webinar, I want to mention that we'll put links in the show notes to the webinar video and to some of the most insightful reviews and commentary out there about the film, including a new review of the film by William Reese, co-originator of Ecological Footprint. Okay, let's go to the webinar. Welcome to the Planet of the Humans, a sequel webinar. I'm Dave Gardner. First, I want to just give you a Quick rundown on what the agenda is for the evening. We'll do uh, brief introductions, then we will have a panel discussion. I anticipate about 45 to 50 minutes in, that's our goal, we will get to a question and answer period. And then we will run uh, for 90 minutes total, as long as there are good questions and we're having a robust discussion. I'll introduce the panelists uh, shortly, but first a quick word about the two organizations that are uh, co-hosting this. First of all, uh, Growthbusters. It's a uh, public education project to help get our society into recovery from growth addiction. I launched the nonprofit uh, in order to produce the documentary Growthbusters Hooked on Growth, which was released in 2011. And uh, the project continues to run to this day because we're still busy educating people that we're in overshoot. And that's a product of the size of our economy, or our consumption and our population, or how many consumers there are, that we need to get over our obsession with economic growth and our fear of discussing and addressing overpopulation. The project produces the Growth Busters podcast about sustainable living, which I co-host with Erica Arias, one of our panelists here tonight. And I speak regularly at college campuses, churches, associations and clubs, as well as doing uh, media interviews. World Population Balance is the other uh, co-host for the evening. That's a nonprofit working to alert everyone around the world about human overpopulation, that it exists, and it is solvable through freely chosen small families. We're working to create a world where no one suffers in dire poverty and misery for lack of enough food, water, and other basic needs. A world where all species thrive and where lower consumption and population are in balance with Earth's finite resources. I serve as executive director of World Population Balance, and I also co-host the Overpopulation podcast for that organization, also with Erica Arias. One more thing I want to share about World Population Balance is this interesting 
project. It's really the most exciting and newest project. Uh, it's the One Planet, One Child Billboard campaign, celebrating small family choices. You can learn more about it at oneplanetonechild.org. All right, let's uh, introduce the panelists. I'm really thrilled to be joined by three very smart thinkers with valuable experience and really good hearts too. I'll let each of them introduce themselves to you. Christine, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Dave. Uh, my name is Christine Mattis. I'm an interdisciplinary environmental scientist and writer. Uh, my writing basically focuses on science and environmental justice and uh, social justice. I have a background prior to teaching at the university level of being a science and health teacher in secondary school and particularly in an environmental justice neighborhood. Um, and I also worked in the House of Representatives in the federal government in science hearings and environmental hearings and have some knowledge about how policy goes through our federal government system and the kind of things that go on in the federal government, among other past experiences. And I come to this uh, topic primarily, even though my PhD is in environment and resources, my initial degree in my background is primarily as a biologist who studies health. So my interdisciplinary background encompasses both social and natural sciences, but I look at this topic as one of more than just climate crisis, but focusing on both human health and ecological health and how what we do to the planet affects both. Great, thank you. Brian Check. Yeah, my name is Brian Check, and I'm the executive director of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, CASI. And uh, our mission at CASI is to uh, advance the steady state economy as the sustainable alternative to growth. And we do that largely by raising awareness of the fundamental conflict between economic growth and very important other goals, environmental protection, economic sustainability, national security, and international stability. I started CASI in 2003 while I was still working in the headquarters of the US Fish and Wildlife Service as a conservation biologist uh, because I could see the, the fundamental conflict between economic growth and biodiversity conservation. And I was not allowed to even talk about that, even though that was central to my PhD research and part of the reason I had been hired there to begin with. So that's why I established CASI and I'm really glad to be on, the, on this podcast and collaborating on and off with Growth Busters. Great, thanks for being here tonight, uh, Brian. And then finally, Erica Arias. Hi, I'm Erica Arias. I am co-host and co-producer of both the Growth Busters podcast and the Overpopulation podcast. I've been working with Dave on um, the Growth Busters project since last April and World Population Balance since November of last year. I am an advocate for sustainable living and the child-free choice. And I am a newly admitted graduate student. I will be attending the University of Oregon this fall, and I hope to study the intersection between population, environmental sustainability, and the child-free choice. Great, thanks, Erica. Glad that you're all here. You can begin asking questions at any time. We will be collecting them and moderating them. So uh, anytime you come up with a good question, just click on Q&A on your screen and type in your question. Before we start the discussion, I want to find out just a little bit about you. So I've got a poll I've put up. If you wouldn't mind answering these two questions for us, I would appreciate it. While you're busy doing that, I want to do two things. One is I want to remind you that we are not here to debate the accuracy of any of the details. We are here to figure out what value we can take from the film in charting a, a fair, just, sustainable path to a beautiful world that, that works for everyone. That's what we want to focus on tonight. 
We've invited two additional smart people to join the discussion when we get to Q&A, and I want to introduce them now just really quickly to you. First of all, Carolyn Vandendolder. She's Special Projects Coordinator for World Population Balance, a longtime staffer at the organization, a frequent contributor to the Overpopulation Podcast. Thanks for joining us, Carolyn. Delighted to be with you. Thanks, to everybody, for joining. That's great. We'll look forward to hearing from you when, uh, when we need to. And then Alan Ware, uh, he is another longtime World Population Balance staffer, research associate, newsletter editor, and he'll be moderating the questions and actually reading the questions to us when we get to Q&A. Thanks for joining us, Alan. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here. Like I mentioned, they are going to join us during Q&A, but I've also given them permission to suddenly appear during the earlier discussion if they really think we've uh, overlooked something, left something out. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. That should be uh, enough time for everybody. And then I'll share the results with you all. Let's see. All right, it looks like we've got about 90% of us here have seen the film. I've kind of figured that that would be the case. 31% think it's important for people to see. 6% think it's better that people not see the film. And then on the content of the film, uh, let's see, 22% uh, agreed with the statement that it slapped them in the face with important perspective. 59% felt like they uh, got important information from the film. And 25% already knew what the film uh, had in it. So uh, gives us a little bit of an interesting snapshot of you guys. We'll do one more real brief poll right when we start the uh, Q&A. Let's get the show really on the road now. Uh, this first uh, topic that I want to chat about is uh, really kind of general comments about the film, the biggest takeaway from the film. And I'll just introduce by sharing a quick thought. I really think it's unfortunate that a divide has been created within the environmental movement. That really hurts us all. I think we all have the same goal, a beautiful world, adequate healthy food, adequate clean water, affordable shelter, habitable climate, happiness, fulfillment for this generation and every generation to follow. Uh, we all have that goal. Uh, so I really hope we can focus a lot tonight on continuing the conversation that this film has started about achieving that goal. And uh, I want to quickly quote Planet of the Humans co-producer Ozzy Zenner in an Extinction Rebellion live streamed event May 5th with Extinction Rebellion co-founder Claire Farrell. Ozzy said this, the fundamental issue is that we're facing a huge potential breakdown of the living world. And we're attempting to address that with another layer of technological solutions that require mining, fossil fuels, another set of challenges. The underlying message of the film is that we need to shift out of that story. All right, I've said my piece. So take it away, Brian, Erica, or Christine. I guess I'll start. One of the things that I was interested to talk about, which you brought up this this divide that seems to have occurred because of the film or that is maybe being made to be a divide when it shouldn't be. However, I, I do think that the fracture had already been there a bit. Since there's been more activism on environmental issues, particularly climate, there has been, well, first of all, what some people I would say call climate myopia, and we have been focusing so much on the climate crisis, not that we shouldn't, it's a tremendous existential crisis, but sort of to the detriment of every other environmental issue we have. And there have been people in the environmental movement that I know who have not only felt marginalized, but actually are marginalized in communities with their work because Everything about renewable energy and green, the Green New Deal and the climate crisis has taken precedent over issues such as toxic contamination and industrialization and resource use and environmental justice. And, and traditionally, environmental justice issues had a lot to do with pollution and toxification and not climate. Now, of course, climate is an issue for um, environmental justice communities, but I think this fracture was already there and there's a lot of people that already felt pushed out. And this film sort of demonstrated why that fracture was there. And I don't think it's something that can't be mended, but I think the only way to mend it is for 
everyone who is interested in tackling the climate crisis, along with every other ecological crisis going on, which is, of course, the biodiversity crisis, the toxics crisis, the resource use crisis, land use. We need to come together and talk about all these issues as one. That is the only way for true ecological sustainability. And when we, um, when we think that people can't handle all these issues as one, I think it's not only detrimental to the movement, it's detrimental to all of humanity, to all of ecology. And it's a little patronizing to people because I've heard from plenty of people who, who know all these things are connected. And actually the solutions can and should be connected. Otherwise they're, they're ineffectual solutions. So I guess that's, that's my point right now. That's a great point, and I'd like to follow up on it a little bit because that fracture, I think, also is represented by whether or not the person in the environmental community does or does not recognize and, and help raise awareness of limits to growth. And mm -hmm. you, those that don't, our experience at Cassie is that those who don't raise awareness of that tend to be the same with either climate myopia, as, as it's called, or, or clean water myopia or clean air. You know, there are a number of myopias out there, biodiversity myopia, but climate clearly is the predominant myopia now in the environmental movement. And there has been for a long time this fracture between those who, as Christine said, do not recognize the big picture or, or, or have decided sometimes, sometimes more, more or less consciously, because it's so hard to get funding, for example, to deal with the big picture. It's not quite as hard for, uh, you know, concentrated costs, concentrated benefits types of policy arenas. So if there's a particular forest that's uh, about to be bulldozed or something, you can find some support from a local community to fight that. So that's one of the reasons, you know, there are basic reasons in political economy why there are many groups focused on individual topics rather than, than very many focused on the big picture, which I think we can say boils down to limits to growth. And that was the beauty of Planet of the Humans. It really helped to make that point. Yeah, and you know, I'm reminded of that. There's a great piece that Christine actually wrote in Medium, a uh, review of Planet of the Humans. And I think, Christine, you really nailed it where you talked about this marketing problem that uh, the film created for the renewables uh, advocates and renewables industry. And I really think I've, I've worked my entire adult life, unfortunately, mostly producing propaganda for Fortune 500 companies and big PR firms and marketing and PR, I think, has gotten in our way a little bit because, uh, sure, if you're trying to really just get people moved into, you know, get us to adopt renewable energy as quickly as possible, you know, good marketing practices don't provide any distractions, don't give any people any of the, the other things that they might have to do. And, you know, I'm still kind of on the fence about whether they, they uh, whether that's the right thing. Uh, obviously, Planet of the Humans has kind of let the cat out of the bag. The cat was sort of out of the bag already, but it's let the cat out of the bag for another 8 million or more people now that uh, there's more to the story. And so I think they're going to be forced to tell the whole story. And that would be the best uh, outcome of the film. Unfortunately, the film hurt a lot of feelings. And uh, so it'll be, uh, it'll be challenging for everybody to put their big boy and big girl pants on and say, OK, OK, how can we make the best of this? Thank you. Dave, for saying we need to put our big girl boy and big girl pants on. Very true. Thank you, Christine, for writing that exceptional piece. And Brian, for sharing your insight as well. I want to start with saying I think it is important for us just as professionals, as advocates, as scholars, for us to acknowledge that, yes, there were some, some issues with the film. It wasn't perfect. But what, what film is perfect, right? I think a lot of people took and picked at the very easy, outdated statistics and very little, you know, maybe the misrepresentation of certain people in the film and, and just, just used that to just shatter the whole thing. And that should not have happened. I, 
I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge like, yes, these were errors, but it did not blind the whole picture, right? The bigger picture when I saw the film and I tried to remain as objective as possible while watching it, because I just think that that's our job. That's what we have to do. And the big picture, what I took from the film was that we will never achieve true sustainability so long as this capitalistic system uh, prevails. And why? Because the whole system incentivizes and feeds us this one and only narrative that there are no limits to growth. And that means more production, more consumption, more people, that we're all expected to be parents and that we're all supposed to just follow this cycle of, uh, that our parents followed. And that's just not true anymore. It's done. It's an outdated model that just doesn't work for anybody anymore. And main point too is that technology, it's not the end all be all in the way. So is it a, is it a, is renewable energy a sham? Only if you're looking at it as the one and only fix that's going to save all of us and, and denying that there are other issues that we need to get serious about and expecting for that one fix to, to be our way out just removes all personal accountability. And we need to get serious about changing ourselves. Yeah, the film didn't shatter my faith in renewable energy. I don't know whether if it did yours or everyone else's. I know it did some people, but I, you know, I believe we have no choice. We absolutely have got to transition to renewable, but I think the film underscored the fact that uh, we're, you know, we're not on our way to net zero carbon by mid-century like we need to be, and there's just no way we can get there if we continue growing our economy 3% a year or even 2% a year and our population 1% a year, you know, at a 2% annual growth rate, the economy doubles in size in 35 years. So you've got a, you've got in 35 years, twice as big an economy that has to be completely converted to run on renewable energy. I don't know how many people think that's really possible. Well, first of all about renewables, I was just reading something today that a friend wrote and he actually had a chapter in his book about the Ivanpah uh, solar array, the largest solar array in California. And forget about the efficiency of these renewables. One of the issues is because we're stuck in capitalism, and, and as I see it actually, that the Green New Deal that, that is being touted that everybody is pushing for, and I'm not saying we don't need something like it, but I think it needs a lot of improvement. It maintains capitalism, maintains this growth. And so in terms of the renewable project, like in California, I'm going to mention some of the things that he talked about with this solar array. The biologists who had to come in and excavate the area or, or survey the area, they had to remove the desert tortoises, which are an endangered species. They initially thought, I believe it was for this area, that there were 25 desert tortoises that they had to come and remove. It turned out that there were 150 that they had to move to create this. And the tortoises, that 50% of them die when they are moved from one place to another because of stress or predation. So that's another issue with these renewables. But the other thing that he pointed out in his book was that there's great tax incentives being given to this consolidated energy, these large scale infrastructures of solar. And the the incentives given to individuals to put solars on their homes are being taken away. Pacific Gas and Electric in California apparently only allows so many people to put solar on their homes in a given community or a given array of homes or a neighborhood. And so we are, the solutions we have such as solar, not to say that renewable energies should be thrown away, that we're just gonna stay on fossil fuels. However, the incentives that are being given are corporate incentives, not small scale incentives. And the, the transition that will be most sustainable that most of us can see now is localization, localization of energy, localization of farming, making everything into a smaller scale. And in a lot of these solutions we're seeing that are given by the large NGOs and the ones that our government is more receptive to allow billionaires to become even larger billionaires and 
allow large infrastructures to continue. And not only is that more harmful for our inequality problem, but it's more harmful in terms of the effects it has on ecology. When you, you know, you would put solar panels on a home, you're not affecting a whole desert ecology. Like when you build this humongous solar array in the desert and you pretend that the desert is a wasteland when it's actually a thriving ecosystem. So, um, I have some more things to say, but I, I'll leave it at that with the renewables right now. Okay, and we do, I want to keep us on track and we need to yeah. sort of take a little bit of a, of a leap forward, although it's uh, just barely going to be a perceptible segue, I think. The next question I wanted to pose for everyone is big picture again. What does our society need to do in response to the issues raised in the film and what barriers need to be overcome? Uh, real quickly, just as a conversation starter, uh, Jeff Gibbs wrote on uh, the Planet of the Humans website, a world in which nature heals and revives will be a world full of the right kinds of magic. Millions of square miles of technology plastered across the planet is the wrong kind of magic. And he also wrote, our only hope is to design a world in which less is the new more and nature recovers, a world where the well-off humans share it with those who have less, a world in which humanity reinvents itself. The floor is open. I'd like to try to put this in very practical policy terms, because if you don't have policy that fits that magical vision, well, I'm afraid that magical vision is going to get polluted and eclipsed. And, you know, we recognize that we have a number of policies in the federal tax codes, in the federal budget, at the Fed, policies that are designed to grow the GDP, population and per capita production and consumption of goods and services. And so I think if we're going to get serious about the message from Planet of the Humans, we must get at those policies that lead us into the directions that you saw manifesting in that documentary. And uh, I think the place to start in very practical terms, once again, is the Employment Act or as it, as it was amended in 1978, the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. That's what really got the United States into the growth game. And uh, Christine and Erica both talked about capitalism. And of course, we have to recognize the shortcomings of capitalism, but, and especially some notion of a laissez-faire free market capitalism. But on the other hand, it's not just about capitalism. It's about the very practical national goal for most nations of the world pursuing GDP growth from the most capitalist to the most communist. You know, the Soviet Union, they hit limits to growth in the last quarter of the 20th century, and they trashed half of Eastern Europe and, and Russia, what's now Russia, and Soviet Asia in the process. And so, you know, the American Constitution, it's not all about capitalism. It's it establishes a capitalist democracy. And I think the key is we have to have a balance of democratically derived environmental protections and regulations that, that amount to a, a smart uh, democratic rider of that capitalist horse. But we can't centrally plan everything that happens in the economy. You know, we have to put caps on energy extraction and energy use. And that's a, a huge step right away to a steady state economy. And then at some point, you know, it's clear that the current $21 trillion or what was at the end of 2019, a $21 trillion American economy and an $87 trillion global economy, that's not going to be sustainable in the long run. And so there will be in the 21st century needs for degrowth back down to a sustainable steady state economy. And I think we can accomplish this or in policy terms. We can get a long way there by completely amending and in large part replacing the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. Just to piggyback on what you're saying, I think there's a tension, and maybe this is where the fracture is that, we're, that I was talking about, between what in academic and within and without academic circles is known as eco-modernism versus degrowth. And the eco-modernists seem to have the floor right now who are proposing sort of a technological utopia where 
the economy still grows and we still have all of this technology that we love to have right now and we're still having all of these, um, basically much of it entertainment and frivolous sort of activities and parts of our society that really just are not sustainable. Whereas the people who subscribe to degrowth, like you're talking about, are looking toward a more circular economy where we have cradle to cradle technologies and where there are limits to growth and we are actually shrinking certain sectors of our economy and our society. And as a matter of fact, Amsterdam within this pandemic has just adopted what they call the donut economy. And it's a more sustainable circular type of economy. And I think what we found is that uh, the people who sort of responded well toward Planet of the Humans are the, the degrowth factor who realize that we cannot continue consuming the way we do. Our economy cannot continue to grow the way it does. There are limits, you know, there, I've heard people say, we all want a slice of the pie. And then some people say, we all don't all need a, an equal slice because the pie keeps growing. Well, if the pie is the earth and the earth's resources, that does not keep growing. And so it's pretty clear now with all of the aspects of our ecology that are collapsing that we cannot continue with this growth. However, the eco-modernists believe somehow we are going to decouple our technology from the basic laws of physics and chemistry and biology and that we will sort of technology our way, if, if I can use that as a verb, into maintaining a growth lifestyle. And none of it has proven scientifically accurate. But I think that's where we're seeing this fracture. And I think the degrowth movement is much larger in Europe. And I think it's something that, I think there is a, there's a silent maybe majority or minority here in America who are very interested in, in that. But I don't think we have the voice and I don't think we have the political power right now. And I would blame that on our media and on our um, political system and our social system. But I think it's, that's something that we need to adopt. I'm really pretty amazed that the uh, we seem to be more ready for that conversation than I thought we ever were going to be. It seemed like we were so stuck for so long, and so I see a lot of of signs of hope. Uh, I want to piggyback on a couple of things that both of you said real quick. Uh, first of all, Brian, of course, uh, ec economic policy is so fundamental to this because we really absolutely have got to get economic policy that doesn't chase GDP growth anymore, but actually measures well-being and considers well-being uh, the goal and, and the metric. And I think we're seeing some signs, a little, we're kind of getting an example of that a little bit during the COVID shutdown, because there's not that much discussion of, uh, there's only a few people really watching G GDP. Most of the news reports I'm seeing are really about how people are doing you know, how people are navigating this and surviving this. And I think we need to see more of that. And then, Christine, you mentioned uh, technology and, uh, yeah, decoupling. Erica and I have called it decoupling nonsense on the Growth Busters podcast. Mm -hmm. There's been a little bit of decoupling, but, uh, but not that much. And to bet the farm on technology, I want to remind people who are old enough to, to have heard of it, Severide's Law. Uh, which was uh, coined by Eric Severide, who was a really great newscaster uh, alive before many of you were born, I'm sure. His law was the chief cause of problems is solutions. And uh, technology really has a lousy track record when you think about it. Technology gave us DDT, thalidomide, asbestos, malathion, PFAS, the forever chemical in Teflon and outdoor gear and firefighting foam. Uh, Fukushima, Love Canal, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Bhopal, Deepwater Horizon, Exxon Valdez. Uh, it's not hard to come up with a long list of reasons to, uh, to not trust technology. The only hope for technology to shrink our footprint so that we don't continue crippling the life supporting ecosystems of, of the planet is to create something that is so complex where you just keep on adding new layers of technology to fix the problems that the that the last layer created. It is so complex, it's a, a house of cards and, and so fragile that uh, there's just there's just no reason to bet the farm on that when you could be 
doing the simple stuff, like getting in touch with what really counts, and it's not GDP, and uh, and it's not population growth. And then lastly, I just want to put in a, a word for a contracting global population, too. That is a part of this picture of the new beautiful world, because an economy needs to be sized to meet the needs of the population. Uh, we can definitely make some adjustments in, you know, how high on the hog we want to live, but we have basic needs that have to be met. And so the bigger the population, the bigger the economy is going to be or, or has to be. So we need to not just end population growth, but actually let population start contracting back toward really less than half of its current 7.8 billion people. The best scientists tell us sustainable human global population is 3 billion, maybe even less than that. That tells us the direction that we need to go. And there are beautiful ways to, to do that, which I'll talk about a little bit in the next section when we get a little bit more into the details. Yeah, to, to go on what you were talking about, there's also something known as, a, I believe it's called Jevons paradox. and you know, this is the one of the problems that I see with relying on renewable technology when we're not talking about reducing consumption and reducing growth, because it's like when you build an extra lane, and this is a matter of fact in the, I, I saw this happen in the DC area when I lived there, you build extra lanes on the beltway there, and you just get more traffic, and it doesn't, you know, you make something more efficient, you build more renewables, people use more energy. So, and we also are always assuming that people are going to use more energy. In, in scientific models, one of the reasons that we can't seem to find a so-called so solution is because we're always assuming that people must use more energy, energy consumption must go up. And part of that, like you said, is because population is growing exponentially. And part of it is because we keep consuming more energy that we really don't need for a comfortable lifestyle. And of course, so many of us are using much more than others. And there's that equity issue that really needs to be a part of the picture too. Yeah, and on the other side of that same coin, that technology was never free to begin with. That this always seems to come up missing in discussions about R&D policy and so forth. The thought is, well, if we just uh, come up with enough technological progress, we can overcome all these problems and have green growth. But coming up with new technology is always based upon growth, based upon the pre-existing levels of technology. That's the macroeconomic explanations for Jevons' paradox. You know, Jevons wrote about coal in England in the late 19th century, but it's a macroeconomic phenomenon as well. To get the tremendous amounts of research and development needed now just for marginal improvements in things like energy efficiency, it takes much more agricultural and extractive surplus at the base of the economy because that's where you free the hands for the division of labor into the, the manufacturing and the service sectors, including research and development. It was a negative sum game all along to think that we were going to somehow reconcile economic growth with environmental protection via technological progress. Mm -hmm. Brian, when I'm president, I want you to be the chair of my Council of Economic Advisors. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Secretary uh, of the Interior would be better. <laughs> We're over time, but Erica, if you have a quick comment, I'll let you sneak in before we move on to the next subject. I just want to say, like, how are we going to get over this? Well, first, we need to... We really just need to get over what I like to call the arrogance of humanism and that we're not the only species on this planet, right? So that means we need to have more effective conversations about overpopulation and our impact on this planet. And I sound like a broken record, but this is so important because it's both in support of and motivated by social justice. We want to have these conversations because we want to see a world where there are less starving people and people with jobs and people who have everything that we in the North Side have. And point number two is what I see when I see the overselling of renewable energy is just this abusive and codependent relationship between the masses and these corporations of people who are 
desperately looking for some answer, someone to tell them that it's okay. And instead of looking within themselves and trying to really solve these bigger issues. And that means that we have to see a shift in our, in our economic system at the end of the day, because it's taking advantage of these people. It's never been about healthier, happier people. They don't care. You know, I suspect that each of us has a lot more thoughts on all of this. So I'm going to make a proposition. I meant to mention that we are uh, going to repurpose the audio from this webinar as an episode of both of the podcasts that Erica and I uh, co-host, the Growth Busters podcast and the Overpopulation podcast. And maybe I can uh, persuade everybody here to uh, reconvene maybe just for a part two uh, as, as a podcast. Maybe we'll do another webinar, but maybe we'll just do a, another podcast episode. In the last section of panel discussion, uh, drill down a little bit more into the details. How do we accomplish those big picture changes that we've been talking about? And I'll do a quick intro for that. What's happening in our current pandemic slowdown that we might want to keep? In his book, Capitalism and Freedom, economist Milton Friedman wrote, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. Do we have the right ideas lying around? I'm hoping maybe we do. What do you guys think? Well, rather than talk about um, economic and social policies, I, I think I wanted to bring up something that sort of goes along with what Erica was saying. Uh, while we need to change our infrastructures and, and we need large scale systemic changes, I think we need changes from top to bottom and bottom to top. So I do think individual changes are necessary. And I think one of the biggest things is we need new paradigms for life and new social norms. So I think that that's something that this pandemic did bring up. I, th I also see sort of mainstream broadcasting going against these new norms that we could be bringing toward the plate. So, for example, we have this idea, especially in America, that when we get older, and if we're aspiring to middle class or upper middle class lifestyle or more, that we deserve certain material things. We deserve vacations. We deserve to take trips all over. We deserve certain cars. Just unbelievable amounts of superficial material items that we think we deserve. And I don't think we are going to get towards sustainability having those same desires. However, when, if we can change what is seen as normal in our, in our lives, and we can, we can also model what is normal as a way to live, either not driving a car or not using a car very often or having a very small car that you have for 15, 20 years. Um, simple things like that that you can model for neighbors and friends there's all sorts of things we could go into, but we need to change our social norms with how we live in our society for a simpler lifestyle to show that this can be done and it actually makes for a much better life for not only you, but for the people around you. And it makes a more equitable life for everyone. And we, I, I really, I'm going to be my radical self here, but I really think, you know, Bernie Sanders kept going on when he was campaigning about billionaires um, I think it's more than just billionaires. I don't think we can have rich people. Rich people consume too many resources. And the more wealth you have, you are contributing to environmental destruction and you are contributing to equality. If we know we have one earth that has limited resources and you are using way more of the resources and consuming way more of the resources than someone else, then you are taking from other people who need them. So I really think this is something that needs to be more normalized. And perhaps we need to shame people for taking too much rather than exalting these people who are entrepreneurs and making all this money. They are not doing something good for the sustainability of the planet, nor for anybody else on the planet. They're exploiting the earth and they're exploiting all the people on the planet. And that is something that I think we need to change in our, our mindset and our paradigms. Very well said. Yeah, that, that really was. And, you know, the climate crisis and the biodiversity, these are slow crises. And now we have this very sudden, immediate COVID pandemic crisis. And so do we have the right ideas laying around? I think 
Yeah, a lot of people have been working on ideas for moments like this. And I'm going to mention one that we have to offer at Cassie, and that's the Full and Sustainable Employment Act. This is a revamping of the Full Employment, uh, Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act of 1978. It's high time that thing is amended very thoroughly. And so uh, we've already, we posted our proposed Section 2, which is uh, the section on findings and declarations of Congress. And, uh, you know, we're working on fleshing out the, the act. And, you know, if you think about it, the acronym is FSEA. And so with a little bit of license, you can envision from that the uh, Full Seas Act. Because we heard before alluded to the metaphor of the rising tide lifts all boats. But there's no more water to raise that tide. The seas are full of boats. There's no more boat building material on shore left anymore. So, you know, we have to uh, deal with that, that fundamental problem of limits to growth. And we can have fiscal and monetary and trade policies that push businesses and individuals and other countries to grab for the remaining resources. We have to go the opposite direction. So there are ideas waiting there ready to be picked up during this COVID caused recession. I want to put in a quick plug uh, for Brian and then turn the mic over to you, Erica. Head over to steadystate.org. The Steady State Herald, Brian, posted a a really nice piece just today about the Full and Sustainable Employment Act. I'm not a policy wonk. I'm glad that there are people like you who are thinking along those lines, and it really sounds good. Thank you. I'll speak really quickly. I think Christine had something to add, but thanks so much, Christine, for uh, talking about cultural change and so you know changing our social norms. Because I, I spent a lot of time really thinking about motivations and what drives people's decision making, and almost to the point to where I get, I get obsessive about it. But I, I really do think that's a, an excellent idea, sort of a wealth a wealth shame <laughs> tactic. I guess you can't really do that for parents because you know we, we want equality. We, we you know it's not like a fight against the child free and, and people who are parents. But I, I, I do think that we do need to spend this time, especially whether we're in a pandemic or not, I I think we really need to look within ourselves and and ask like, what do we want out of life? And not just follow these patterns that everybody, not just everybody, but every aspect of our culture tells us that we need, that we want these things. And we don't, you know, if we actually spent some more time thinking about this, we, we might find that, hey, I actually don't want to have all these luxurious items. I don't want to live in a five bedroom house. I don't want to uh, have kids. And I keep bringing kids up because that's my focus. And I will say that I do think that we need to celebrate marginalized people and the child free are a very marginalized group. And I think we, it's time that we start celebrating them as much, if not more than parenthood than those who are parents because in every direction that you look it's a celebration of, of parenthood and, and it's no wonder why people think that that they want that because they also want to be celebrated and there's really no celebration in our pronatalist society for people who opt out of parenthood but there ought to be because not just as something that is uh in support of environmental sustainability, but but also what it means on a social and an individual level. How many child-free people out there do you see helping support the children of their family members or neighbors or friends, right? So there's a place for them in society. Um, and I think that this film really motivated me to speak more freely about that and to celebrate these people more because they really are saving the planet, even if they don't know it. <laughs> and I'm very biased. <laughs> Once again, we're over time. Christine, did you have a final follow-up on this segment? Um, I'll I'm try to make it quick. Okay. I'm also child-free, and it's something that I've rarely ever talked about. And it's for a number of reasons, but one of the most predominant reasons is that I did not want to have an American child, particularly, who would probably consume up to five Earth's worth of, you know, relatively Earth's worth of materials compared to other children on the planet. But it is, like Erica said, something that you really, it's fine to talk about your three or five, your six children. It's not fine to talk about choosing not to have a child 
for reasons that are not selfish that you want to have more for yourself, but reasons that are sort of more societal and global. And one last thing I want to say about social norms, um, and this is just a quick anecdote. When I was very young and I worked in a bookstore, we had an elaborate recycling program. And if you know how the book market works, um, mass market paperback books are not returned when they are unsold. They are thrown away, like so many of our materials. And this is a big problem. But when I was working in the bookstore, I would always tell everyone I worked with, because we, t- we were um, receiving and re- sending books back to the publishers, with these mass market paperbacks that get thrown away, I told everyone, recycle, recycle, recycle. And they weren't recycling them. They were ready to just toss them. And these friends that I made at the bookstore constantly told me after that, I can't not recycle paper anymore. Every time I think about throwing in the trash, I hear you, you're like on my back saying recycle. So that was sort of, you know, just my own personal, tiny little, minute social norm that I created to help people recycle paper. And of course, we need to do this on a much larger scale. Yeah, great example, great example. Well, I hate it that we absolutely are blazing through this 90 minutes. Uh, We're going to... Flip into Q&A now. I'm going to launch uh, our second and last poll real quickly, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit about what your current thinking is now that you've uh, had a chance to have your minds poisoned by us. And I want to reintroduce Alan and Carolyn into the conversation and really encourage them to chime in as well. And Alan, get ready to start hitting us with the best of the questions. We're going to run for another almost 40 minutes. All right, I'm going to end the poll because we've got to keep on moving. Let's see how we did. What will you do after seeing Planet of the Humans and attending this webinar? Nobody's going to Disneyland. I'm kind of glad to hear that. That's good. 57% work harder to shrink my level of consumption. That's pretty outstanding. 8% conceive fewer children than I previously planned. Maybe that's because we don't have a really young crowd or we haven't made the full case there. 65% said they will increase their support for economic reform. 55% increase my support for smaller families. Those are really good numbers. I'm glad to see that. 14% increase my support for technology solutions. 14% decrease my support for technology solutions. And 55% are uh, saying that they will support world population balance and or growth busters and or CASI. So... That's great. These are all pretty scrappy little nonprofits that just run on uh, mostly on donation revenue, occasionally a small grant. So uh, your help is really appreciated in that. All right, Alan, what have you got for us in the question department? Okay, I've got two that are related to the Real Green New Deal project. Michael Dowd had asked if we're familiar with it, if we've seen the website. Uh, he says it seems both wildly unrealistic and the only morally defensible direction for our species. What do you think? And then in a related question, Paul Sutton, who is with the Real Green New Deal, says, is the Green New Deal trying to sell perpetual growth fueled on renewable energy? In other words, is the Green New Deal avoiding the limits to growth? Yeah, so far, I mean, the the main proponents on the hill are about green growth. But I think there are a handful of them, like uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, for example, who is ready to uh, leave that milieu and uh, start pursuing the the idea of a steady state economy with stabilized population and per capita consumption. So I think the, the, the Green New Deal, as it was originally uh, passed through Congress as a resolution, yeah, that's, that's not going to get us to where we need to go. But it, it planted a lot of good seeds for these kinds of discussions. And uh, the, the website that was featured in that one question, I had a chance to glance at it. And it's got a lot in common with what we've been talking about, especially early on when Christine was talking, as well as myself, about the failure in a lot of the environmental community to look at the big picture So the Real Green New Deal website, that's largely one of their main points as well, is it's not all about climate change. We've got a biodiversity crisis. We have eroding soils. We have dammed up and choked off rivers, you know, and we have all kinds of air pollution problems. 
besides greenhouse gas emissions. And we have forever chemicals stacking up and plastic particulates in the oceans. So I think it's really important for the environmental community to connect those dots and uh, to get back to the big picture of things. But that's about as far as I had a chance to get on it. I just want to quickly mention that the reason uh, Brian had a chance to go look at the website was we had invited every attendee when you registered, you were invited to pre-submit a question. And so we had a couple of those. And this question from Michael Dowd had been emailed to us. And so if you're curious about the real Green New Deal, the website is realgnd.org. And uh, Christine, did you have a chance? Are you familiar with it? Do you have a few things to say about that? I wasn't familiar with it. I did have a chance to look at it. And I, I agree, it probably is. the. From what I saw, it seemed like it encompassed everything. And it is kind of the road we need. And the thing is, it's funny to say it's wildly optimistic, because I don't think anybody has a whole lot of optimism at this point about. But the thing is, everything we do, it's it's optimistic or it's unattainable until we actually do it. And when it comes to policy, we can't offer just little incremental solutions because we know we're never going to get what we ask for from our government. We need to have these humongous radical solutions. The, as the IPCC said, we need radical change. This is a conservative scientific body saying that we need radical change. So to offer a radical solution and have to draw back from that is exactly the kind of things we need, the exactly kind of the policies we should be proposing, as radical as possible, and then scaling back. If we don't go that far, we'll never get anywhere we need to go. Well, just two or three years ago, this kind of thinking would really be scary to so much of the electorate. But today, I don't think it's nearly as scary. And I know I've been in conversation with the the people who've been standing it up, and they've just been working on the website, I think, just appeared a month or two ago, and it's really not fully functional. It is really new, but it does have some really good principles that go farther uh, as necessary than the original Green New Deal. So I'm really going to keep an eye on it and support this initiative as much as I can. All right, Alan, another one? Here's a pretty broad question from Robert Barry just asking, what is meant by environmental justice? Eric, I know you've got ideas on that. No, she won't have anything to say. <laughs> environmental justice, I think, in just the, the simplest terms is giving everybody on this whole planet every species, every human, equal access to the bare essential necessities that you need to live and thrive. And that includes, I don't think I need to tell you all what it, what it includes, but just in case you really need to know, that's clean air, clean water, housing. And I'll add in, you know, social justice as, as sort of, I look at the two, right? Social justice, and then just an extension of that is environmental justice. But you know, education, um, healthcare, everything that you would need to live and thrive in a society and not disproportionately putting others at risk of living in an environment that doesn't offer these things because of their color, their race or ethnicity or their social economic status, right? So it, it's, I hope that made sense, but it's everybody deserves to live in a clean and healthy space. Yeah, to me, it means a lot less conspicuous consumption, like we were talking about a few minutes ago. That's not environmentally just for, uh, yeah, it was the thing that we kind of got away from the film a little bit, but that film was great for what I would call castigation of the liquidating class. Was it like Branson, you know, flying around the world uh, and wanting to be going back and forth into space? Just think of the ecological footprint not only of the obvious materials, but of the money that must be generated from that agricultural and extractive base to get all the way up to that kind of a consuming lifestyle. So, you know, that's not environmentally just. I was trying to think about why it was that uh, we used to ignore 
environmental justice. And I, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe it was because we hadn't completely filled up the planet yet. And now that we have really filled it up and outgrown it, in order for Richard Branson to live well on his island, someone else has to live really poorly and, and pay the price. There's just no room anymore for the more impoverished people in the world to raise themselves out of poverty. The, the billionaire class has uh, cornered the market on the rest of the resources that we all need. Environmental justice actually has, I, I hope you'll let me read this, the Environmental Protection Agency actually has a, a definition of what environmental justice is. Um, they say it is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regu regulations, and policies. EPA has this goal for all communities and persons across the nation. It will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental health and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. And when I talk about an environmental justice community, there are for sure disproportionate environmental hazards and risks in certain communities. And these environmental risks, usually from pollutants and toxics and environmental contamination, fall unequally on people of color, particularly African Americans. Um, and sociologists have studied this a great deal, and we are not even sure why these environmental injustices fall the hardest on African Americans because it, it actually crosses socioeconomic status. So we can say that most people of color may be of lower socioeconomic status and we see people like that who have more environmental justice issues like pollution in their neighborhoods, like uh, freeways coming by their neighborhoods and, and creating much more air pollution. But it seems that this unequal distribution also falls the hardest on African Americans, and we're not even sure why, because it does cross socioeconomic um, statuses and strata. So that's something we still need to learn, but it mostly falls on people of color and people of lower socioeconomic status. We got to throw in a bit about the Native Americans. I mean, they got Absolutely. ripped off big time. They had adapted to the ecosystems of North America beautifully in many cases, not that there were never cases of over-exploitation of resources, but in general, the population uh, estimates range from, well, from 1 million to 100 million, which, you know, there's some politics involved in those estimates as well. But clearly, there was a, a match of Homo sapiens uh, in Native American cultures to the landscapes that they evolved in. And, you know, they have been forced off the landscape into tiny reservation. Many tribes were completely wiped out by smallpox. And I guess I'm getting a little carried away because I think, you know, Dave, mm -hmm. I spent, you know, about six years working for tribes and I saw what awesome resources they had had at one time and still had a little bit of in some cases and uh, they lost a lot. So that was like the original case of environmental injustice. In, in North America. Can I bring up one more thing that relates to this pandemic? I think this pandemic is a case of environmental injustice as well, because first of all, this global pandemic occurred, the, the, the root of the problem was ecological exploitation. That is why we have this virus that came from um, one species to another. However, more than that, the people who are being disproportionately affected are people of color, especially in America, and people, or maybe I should say in America, the people of color, people of lower socioeconomic status who tend to have these essential jobs that we, these essential jobs that we pay them the least to do. And they are bearing the brunt of this virus, just like they bear the brunt of all these environmental toxic burdens. And that is what environmental justice is really about. All right, shall we move on to another question, Alan? Okay, here's one from uh, Chris Bystroff. My complaint is that the film spent too little time on limits to growth. Some reacted to the population issue with words like eugenics, racism, etc. These are the knee-jerk reactions resulting of insufficient information. Limits to growth needs a movie of its own. 
And there's still a mistaken notion that population will rise and plateau. I think the focus of that question is, is more a movie about limits to growth. We need a full movie on that. You know, I'm thinking there was a documentary being made with that title, but I cannot recall where, uh, whether that's been finished or is still in the works. I don't know if there's any reason to assume that all hundred of people who are attending this webinar are familiar with limits to growth, but it was a study done by a group of analysts and scientists at MIT back in the early 1970s, computer modeling that uh, ran a bunch of scenarios and the business as usual scenario said that we couldn't grow forever and that if we continued on the track we were, that uh, there was a high likelihood that things would really crash around the middle of this century. And we've been following that business as usual scenario. It's uncanny how closely we've been following that because that was 1971, 1972 technology. It took a whole room full of computers. Uh, they had less computing power, I suppose, than you have in the, in the palm of your hand today. Several books, what I think about four books, it won't one every decade reporting on our progress or lack of progress. So that's the, the background about that. And uh, I think the film, the thing that films are good at is uh, evoking an emotional response. Uh, some of the critics have wondered why the film couldn't get into, you know, get more into the weeds. And I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying limits to growth is the weeds, but why couldn't you provide these details and, and this data and these facts? And, you know, that would be a film for the scientists, a film for the, for the analysts, not a film for the general public. So you do tend to have to gloss over some of those things. And I kind of feel like the film was all about limits to growth. No? Sure seemed to uh, come straight out of it. I think that it brought us to that next film, which I assume that commenter was referring more generically to limits to growth, limits to population growth, limits to GDP growth. Ah, I didn't and, realize that. Yeah, well, if either way, you know, I mean, the book limits to growth would certainly uh, play a large part in any kind of full-fledged documentary about limits to growth. Either way, it, it, that needs to happen. And we sure hope that the next Michael Moore movie is exactly about that. We've had a lot of people tell us that that's their hope as well. And it seemed to be leading right up to it. I, I said in my review of the documentary that it brought us right to the doorstep of the steady state economy. And I really believe that. I think that documentary should be required viewing in a lot of courses about sustainability around the country that introduce or kick off ecological macroeconomics courses, for example. If anyone's wondering whether we have indeed hit or surpassed limits to growth, everything that's before our eyes is really uh, evidence and symptoms of having exceeded those, exceeded planetary boundaries. That's why we have an epidemic of epidemics and more and more severe storms and more intense fires and the climate disruption that we're dealing with and species uh, extinction, fertile soil loss. Uh, it looks like we might only have about maybe 30 or 40 more harvests left before most of the fertile soil of the planet is worthless to us. Freshwater crises, all the toxification that tends to not get talked about that much. I mean, all of that is evidence that we are in overshoot, that we've exceeded the limits to growth. And gosh, the list of scientific reports that really put the hard data to that is a mile long. So the only reason somebody might have missed that is because those news stories get uh, a quick mention, maybe, or a paragraph on page four of the newspaper, and then they're forgotten because it doesn't agree with the, the mythology, with the story that we're all living right now, this myth of uh, eternal growth and prosperity for all. I wanted to say, too, that I think the film, its main goal was not was to open the door for these bigger discussions, but also to kind of strip away the, the veil. We're all living in this illusion that we can have some technological fix and that these renewable energies are the answer. And I just read recently about these um, things called beauty strips that are forests that line highways out west, I think in Oregon, and they actually cover up the strip logging, the, what do they call that? When they just take 
mountain sizes. Those are those are sucker strips. Yeah, sucker you strips. Call them in Washington. Um, but but the fact that they work. I mean, people drive through with these national forests and think, oh my gosh, this is gorgeous, and yet it's just enough to create the illusion of a forest without without seeing the the horrible destruction that's going on. So I feel like this film, it is the first step. It's tearing away kind of. It's it's helping us dismantle the illusions that we have built, um, that we can somehow figure out how to, to live the way we are now and still address all the myriad crises that we're facing. I want to mention something too. Some of the critics of the film said that they are absolutely are not talking about just technological fixes and green energy, that they understand that there's these bigger picture items. However, I would say that whether it's their marketing or what, I'm not sure, that, that I, I'm not sure that they're sincere in that because another article just came out a few days ago talking about this kind of techno utopia we would have if we could just get onto this renewable train. And interestingly enough, the article was written by, I think the head of 350.org. And most of the comments I saw in the article disagreed tremendously and said this is really a delusion and we cannot think we're going to live in the same exact lifestyle we have throughout the world and just enact the green new deal and have renewable energy this is really not sustainable and not a reality so that i thought that was very interesting and i think that there are people all over who are open to this degrowth paradigm if we want to give each panelist about three minutes to uh, make closing comments and we want to stick with uh, being finished at 90 minutes, then that would be the last question we could answer. But we could agree to shorten our closing comments and do one more question, or we could agree to run a little bit long. Anybody want to chime in with a suggestion? Longer is fine. <laughs> Let's try one more question, Alan, at least then. Okay, uh, this is from Mike Hanauer. Institutional resistance to changing the message, like Sierra Club 350.org, NRDC, UCS, is huge. What might be the catalyst to get someone to break out of the mold and change their mindset? I'm assuming he means the message, changing the message to more of a limits to growth message instead of a techno utopian, eco modernist perspective. I'm all over that one. I got to respond to that because, you know, we felt for decades that the catalyst would be a solid foundation of scientific professional society position statements refuting the old fallacious rhetoric that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. So there was uh, somewhat of a movement for about 15 years. The Wildlife Society took a position describing the fundamental conflict between economic growth and wildlife conservation. The American Society of Mammalogists took a position describing the same thing. Uh, the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics did as well, and a handful of others, relatively smaller, uh, you know, scientific professional societies. Then there were a few other ones that were on the cusp of doing that, and that included the American Fishery Society, the Ecological Society of America, and then the mothership of the SCB, the Society of Conservation Biology. And what happened was, and this would have been a great part of the Planet of the Humans documentary because they talked about the big NGOs failing to help on this matter. Those big NGOs either sat in the background and didn't lift a finger to help make that happen, or in some cases, they even went again, they opposed it. They said, no, we don't think there is a conflict between economic growth and environmental protection. So uh, the view at the time by those of us involved in that, that movement was that if we could have gotten a nice full foundation for the big NGOs to stand on then, that they would have been empowered to say, you know what, all these scientists have said that and they have described exactly why we can't have our environmental cake and eat it too for the sake of GDP growth. They would have been, you know, they would have made a huge difference by now in helping towards steady statesmanship, if you will, advancing the steady state economy in domestic policy as well as in international diplomacy. 
it's not necessarily too late for that to happen. You know, the AFS, they, they should have been talking about it now for about the last 12, 13 years. ESA, they as well. And uh, so on with the rest of these scientific professional societies, as well as the big NGOs. And to me, one of the greatest things of the documentary, The Planet of the Humans, is that it's going to put pressure now on the big NGOs to handle it. If they don't start telling it like it is about limits to growth, I think people are going to leave them en masse. And they should, you know, support growth busters. They should join Cassie, you know, world population balance, etc. Go for uh, the efforts that are really making a difference about raising awareness of limits to growth and doing something about it. Thanks, Mike, for your question. I, I guess I will answer your question with another question, which is, why is there institutional resistance when we're looking for these people to actually help us out of this crisis that we're in, right? And I think that when you have a system that profits on a problem, I have to ask, do you even really want to solve that problem? And it's really in every single business. I used to work at a rehab treatment center where we saw people with addiction to drugs and alcohol. And I hate to say it, but I had to ask myself, do, well, what would happen if everybody got sober and there actually was a cure for this addiction? And, and similarly, just the same, our addiction to growth, our addiction to our system, are we ever really going to make it out? Well, I don't know. I, 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 it doesn't really look very promising. It just seems like we're just in this circle of repeating the same mistakes that we've, we already know what the outcome is. And maybe that's just comforting. But I don't really think that they want to solve these problems. And Dave, I guess without going too far on topic, I think you said the paper that you mentioned in the 70s coming out of MIT, I haven't found any papers in the US that have spoken on the subject that were fully funded. I mean, where's the funding for asking these sorts of problems? And it's in everything. It's in an academic setting. It's in corporation. It's everywhere. Like who's investing in actually solving problems and who actually cares to solve them? I'm sorry, Mike, I answered your question with a number of <laughs> more questions. <laughs> Brian, I want to propose that <clears throat> Planet of the Humans is uh, a great demonstration of exactly why those scientists have been reluctant to tell us the truth. Look at the backlash <laughs> that has been heaped on that film, you know, for making a few mistakes, but also for telling us the, the larger truth. And I think, I think it's the job of Planet of the Humans, it's the job of Cassie, it's the job of Growth Busters and World Population Balance to uh, give the scientists some political cover, to, to boldly go where no man or woman has gone before and move the Overton window, uh, the, the, you know, the window of uh, possible conversations and issues to discuss uh, in the right direction. So I think Planet of the Humans has probably given us a uh, a, a big bump, a big nudge in uh, the proper direction to, to where it's a little more okay to have those conversations than it used to be. Absolutely. I've forgotten what the original question <laughs> asked, but I think the idea of why we can't talk about these issues, it comes down to money. I think that's something we didn't even talk about tonight that the film brought out that was very important. The funding for everything in the environmental movement now is coming from huge donors. The big NGOs are all getting their money from huge donors, donors who are part of the capitalist system, who do want to continue economic growth, who are involved in so many other endeavors that are actually contrary to economic sustainability. And these foundations and these donors are controlling the, the message basically. And, so, and, and the people who have a different message are marginalized, not only in journalism, but in science. Research is not allowed to be done into these areas, even though we do already have the research that shows that we have these limits to growth and that we are living in a collapsing world. And so it really comes down to economics. And I guess the only solution to that is that we do need to redistribute wealth and we do need to create a more equitable society because Wealth equals power, equals voice, equals message. And, you know, maybe that involves bringing the marginal tax rate back up to 90% like it was under Eisenhower so we can redistribute wealth so people have what they need and so that people have real democracy because when you don't have 
through basic necessity means you're not part of society and you don't have a voice. Well, I'm glad you brought up democracy because, and Christine, you've been a, a champion of uh, individual action, and that's been a little bit of a, a gripe of mine is, uh, in fact, the last episode of the Growth Busters podcast, what do we call it, uh, just sitting around waiting for the world to end, where we talked about whether uh, we really should just be sitting on our butts and waiting for the system to change, waiting for Congress to enact the policies we need, waiting for big corporations to do the right thing. And someone pointed out just recently, I wish I remembered who wrote it, but that in a democracy or something like a democracy, the elected officials don't lead, the public leads and the elected officials follow. They go where we show them we want them to go. So I think individual action has uh, has real power. And that's one reason I think to uh, walk away with a little bit of optimism, even though we're in a pretty serious crisis. Should we uh, do wrap up comments and maybe promise ourselves to uh, figure out whether we wanna do another part two webinar or uh, continue the conversation on a podcast episode? Okay. Just quickly then, I just want to give each of uh, our main panelists a couple of minutes to uh, make some closing comments, and then we'll wrap it up, I think. Brian, would you like to go first? Okay. Christine, I think, was basically talking about the political economy of environmentalism, and, and in particular, the big NGOs. And it's true that these foundations, they're steering the message. And this is why we don't see them coming to help raise awareness about limits to growth. So I wanna leave our audience with some hope with regard to that, because we have two really important things on our side, sound science and common sense. People can start seeing now, thanks to, to films like Planet of the Humans, we can see limits to growth happening before our very eyes. And the science, when you really dig into it, is right there all the way as well, and including, you know, the more recent development of ecological macroeconomics. So with that on our side, we may not be able to get that foundation funding that's funding the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy and the Union of Concerned Scientists and the World Wildlife Fund and Defenders of Wildlife and so on. But I think we can start getting those members because they do get it. A lot of them uh, have some background in science. That's one of the reasons they joined these NGOs to begin with. And a lot of them have common sense and they're starting to wonder, why aren't these NGOs talking about it? And they may be aware already of the political economy, maybe not in those terms, but they're aware that big money, big foundation money is not having their leadership do what they want them to do as members. So I think there's some hope in that. I think that, oh, one last thing in terms of the hope part. I think that a dollar's worth of limits to growth messaging can overcome, I don't know, 10,000, maybe a million dollars worth of that nonsense that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. That is nonsense. And it's resonating with less and less people, I would say at a, a very rapid rate, it's resonating less. So, <laughs> so there's some hope for the future. That's great. That's great. Christine, would you like to go? I'll tack on what Brian was saying. I think one of the reasons for this backlash to the film is because it didn't have the same messages that some of these large environmental organizations were putting out, getting back to the marketing. And I think one of the problems is the people who are marketing environmentalism right now are keeping it simple as marketers do, as public relations do. We have one message, we stay on point, we have our talking points, and it's, it's fairly patronizing because the people who are involved in the environment know more than that, and they're not necessarily buying it. Maybe they're trying to increase the amount of people who are buying into the environmental message and buying into the environmental movement, but I don't think that is even worthwhile if the message is untrue and it's not the complete picture. And also, we don't need everybody to buy into a certain policy in order to get that policy enacted. I mean, to go back to the policy that is always brought up in, as an example, slavery. You know, did the whole country 
buy into abolishing slavery? No, but we did it for many reasons. But, you know, we don't need the entire electorate to say, yes, let's solve the environmental problem to get these policies enacted. We don't need to market and, and be um, patronizing about it. The other thing is something about science communication. There's something called the spiral of silence. And another message of hope is that I think there are a lot more people who are watching this film and looking at the big picture and have already thought about the big picture and who are afraid to speak because that's not what they're hearing from these big environmental groups and from the big voices who have the platform on the environment. I get a lot of emails and messages from people who read my writing and who I've become friends and acquaintance with throughout the world. And the spiral of silence is this phenomenon in, in communications that was a theory that was started from a German woman about the Holocaust, where she thinks there were more Germans who are against the Holocaust, but were afraid to speak up because they didn't hear other people speaking up. So they felt they would be alienated and shunned if they said that we don't follow the Nazis, we don't believe in this, we are against this. So in the same way, there are people who feel we need to do so much more for the environment, we need to look at the big picture, we need to solve all of these crises at once. We are willing to change our lives from top to bottom. We're looking for systemic change, we're looking for individual change, and we are all in on all of that. But I think there is a somewhat of a spiral of silence coming from the top, keeping these voices down. But again, the hope is that I see is that I hear from all these people, I see their comments online, I get their comments sent to me, and I think those voices are larger than we think, and people are much more open than we think to these messages and these changes we need. Wow, that's great. Great to hear. Erica, final words? I guess just adding on to on the subject of political economy, I think under the prevailing system, Otherwise, good people like Bill McKibben, Al Gore, any of these other people, anybody in the future who wants to actually make a difference and solve a problem, I think that we're all at really great risk just because these people are sooner or later going to be offered big money to do what they want to do. And they're going to be fed this message that this will be made possible. I have the money for you to do this. Let's do it together. But when you're taking somebody else's money, you're no longer promoting your own personal message. You are now working for the big guys. And it sounds <laughs> like, a, like a, when I say it out loud, it sounds like a ridiculous story, but it's the truth. And we're, we are already finding it difficult to figure out what is actual true messaging in our you know, media, our news, what is true, science. Like if this continues on, we're just not going to really be able to see clearly. And I guess um, I want to also say something about political correctness because we didn't talk about that tonight. But I know that a lot of the comments from viewers that watched the film were really disappointed that topics like overpopulation were brought up, even if it wasn't any more than a couple of minutes. I wish there would have been more on that subject. But And I think political correctness is absolutely important. And we work really hard to make sure that we are very careful in our messaging. But I think that we can all also agree that when it prevents us from objectively looking at our ecological crisis for what it really is, which is a result of our inability to live within an allocated budget and we are doomed to repeat the same cycle of systematic harm and death to every species living on this earth, including ourselves. This is a slow suicide. And if we don't change things around, that means our economic system, our political system, and actually have serious conversations about what really needs to be done, then... We're not going to see the change. And I think a lot of people are unfortunately fighting for all the wrong things because they're blinded or because they're in denial. And um, this film, I'm very thankful to Jeff Gibbs and everybody who, who took part in the film because they started the conversation and it wasn't perfect, but at least it got all of us united here today to talk about the important points that were made. 
Yeah, and I'll mention, uh, I don't think Jeff Gibbs thinks that any of what uh, even we've kind of alluded to maybe some mistakes the film made about choosing to tell some older stories. And if you go to planetofthehumans.com, they've been slowly adding more material to the website. So the the filmmakers are defending a lot of the decisions they've made. Uh, so it makes for very interesting reading. I would recommend you go check it out. I just want to summarize, I think, Technology can't save us. Renewable technology is essential, but it's not sufficient. We simply must embrace less, not more. We've got to dethrone economic growth. Its worship is killing us and it will finish us off. Uh, we need to maintain our new relationship that we're developing right now with what really matters in life. Relationships, experiences, time with those we love, that's what really matters, not how many dollars are flowing through the economy or uh, how many toys we have. And we have really got to stop running and hiding from overpopulation. We can solve it beautifully, ethically, voluntarily, but the denial and shaming of sustainable population advocacy has got to stop. And then lastly, I read something the other day that I just wanna share with you. I'll finish with this. This was written by Jake Mayer, publisher at Wordbound Media. And he wrote this about the pandemic. It's pretty short. For many, this has kindled a desire to get back to the basics, family, friends, meaningful work and sustenance, the promise of more, more money, more work, more striving, more productivity is exposed daily as a fraud as many of us are forced to make do with less, yet finding some redemption in simplicity. In time, we will find our new normal and most of us will fall back into some of the old traps and trappings. But the new normal doesn't need to include the same degree of striving and grasping. The new normal is rife with opportunity to build something better, to become someone better. The challenge we face now and for the future is to do more with less, to live more with less. Quality of life can be an elusive end our addicted grasping for more is part of the American mythos, but we are reminded that the meaning is not from things, but from experiences, relationships, and the simple pleasures gained from living our lives in real time and not at jet speed. Christine, Brian, Erica, Carolyn, Alan, and gosh, a large number of attendees who are still with us after this long webinar. I want to thank all of you for a great conversation and your interest in really seeing if we can't have a good finish to this human experiment on this planet. Stay safe, stay healthy, watch for an email with a link to the video of this that you can share with other people and uh, have a good night. Some may dream to pay mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster Some may just want more But don't know what it's for But not me I'm a growth buster Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather But no, not us We are the growth busters Calling, 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 call the growth buster.